we're getting ready for Easter coming up soon, I'm trying to trying to pick out songs that focus on the gospel, which all of our songs should focus on the gospel. But um, we're about to sing the song, Glorious Day, Living He Loved Me. I know our choir usually does that, but I just really have missed doing that song. So we're going to do it this morning, and you guys are supposed to sing with us. Um, but I'm going to read to you in John chapter 1, verse 14. It says, The Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen His glory. Glory is of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. In the last verse, the last little part of the song says, One day the trumpet will sound for His coming. One day the skies with His glories will shine. Wonderful day, my beloved one bringing. My Savior, Jesus, is mine. I don't know about you, but that sounds like a pretty glorious day to me. One day when heaven was filled with his praises, one day when sin was as black as could be, Jesus came forth to be born of a virgin. Dwelt among men, my example is he. The word became flesh and the light shined among us, his glory revealed. Living he loved me, dying he saved me, buried he carried my sins far. Just 
this is the time of the year, and hopefully, <clears throat> excuse me, we all think about it throughout the year, but really at this time of the year as Easter approaches. I can't get that movie out of my mind, The Passion. Um, Daryl and I have not watched it yet this year. It's, it's really hard for me to watch. Um, <clears throat> But when I watched the movie The Passion <clears throat> and I saw Christ walking up that road to Calvary, and even in the movie, it's not as bad as what it was that day. I'm just not used to seeing stuff like that. And I think about, if it had just been me, would he have still died? And he would have. He would have gone just for me. And he did. So... <clears throat> At this time of the year, it shouldn't be just the time of the year that we think about it, but it does focus on Christ's death. But even more than that, his resurrection. And that he did it for me, and that he lives today for me. And that I can go to him at any time and talk to him and have that glorious hope of his appearing. Um, <clears throat> this is a new song. Uh, Josh, Josh Hawks, I believe, brought it to Daryl's attention, and Daryl said, can you sing that? Well, it's not even been a week, and I only heard it on, I think, Wednesday. I said, well, I can try, and you know, I get very nervous when I'm up here to sing, very, very, very nervous, but I just think about, I'm here to praise the Lord and to thank God for what he's done for me. So, <clears throat> I'm sorry, as I, think, as I sing this, I want you to think about what God's done for you with the death of Jesus, his only son on the cross. was a wretch, I remember who I was. I was lost, I was blind, I was running out of time. But sin separated, the breach was far too wide. But from the far side of the chasm, you held me in your sight. So you made a way across the great divide, left behind heaven's throne to build it here inside. And there at the cross, you paid the debt I owed, broke my chains and freed my soul. For the first time I had hope Thank you, Jesus, for the blood of life Thank you, Jesus, it has washed me white Thank you, Jesus, you have saved my life You brought me to glorious light. You, you took my place, laid inside my tomb of sin. You were buried for three days, but then you walked right out again. And now death, it has no sting and life, it has no end. Jesus, you have saved. 
with me. Glory to his name. Glory to his name. Glory to his name. There to my heart was that blood applied. Glory to His name. Tina, thank you very much for that this morning. Beautiful song. Praise the Lord for that. Let me invite you to take your copy of God's Word and join me today in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 23. Luke's Gospel, the 23rd chapter, here we are during the season of Lent. We are moving toward Easter, and uh, during these 40 days of the Lenten season, beginning from with Ash Wednesday all the way up to Easter Sunday, we try to reflect upon our own personal walk with Christ. Uh, we try to, some people try to do without certain things to remind them to sacrifice as we think about the sacrifice that Christ has made for us on the cross. And uh, as I think about that during this Lenten season, I think about what a wonderful opportunity it is to focus on uh, what Jesus had to say from the cross. And of course, we all know that he uttered a number of different sayings, seven to be exact, from the cross. We're going to focus on one of those this morning when he asked God the Father to forgive his executioners. And as we focus on that today, we don't want to leave it there in ancient history we don't want to leave it there at Calvary, but we want to take it from the page and put it into our life and see what we need to do during this Lenten season to uh, make ourselves more aware of extending forgiveness to those who may have uh, offended us or hurt us. So I want to speak to you for the next little while today about the forgiveness factor. The forgiveness factor. So in Luke's gospel, chapter 23, I just want to read a couple of passages beginning in verse number 33. Or excuse me, verse number 32. Luke 23, verse 32. And there were also two other male factors, is what the King James calls them. It's criminals. Led with him Jesus to be put to death. <clears throat> and when they were come to the place which is called Calvary, there they crucified him. And the criminals, one on the right hand and the other on the left. Then Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And they parted his raiment, and they cast lots. So may God add his blessings today as we look at the forgiveness factor. I ran across a cartoon drawing, something like you would find in the funny papers, that says this. It's two guys talking, and one says, I'm telling you, being on face Bible makes following Jesus easy. The other guy says, I can't imagine. The first guy says, every time someone does something wrong to me, I click on this forgive button next to their profile picture. 
If I uh, click it more than 77 times for anyone, Face Bible automatically removes them from my friends list. I don't even have to think about it. Only if it would be so easy, right? But forgiveness is not quite so easy, especially when forgiveness is expected to be extended to someone who may care less that they have hurt us or harmed us or offended us. It is one thing when an individual uh, does something and doesn't mean it, or an individual does something and then they're sorry for it, but it's another thing altogether when an individual may deliberately put you in their crosshairs and try to assassinate your character, or they may try to tear down your, in, your, your lifestyle, or ruin your reputation, or whatever it might be, it's not always easy to exercise forgiveness. But Jesus was our consummate example, and he knew then and he knows now that all of us deal with the issue of extending forgiveness and trying our best to release the other person instead of hoping that that individual gets what's coming to them. You know, some wrongs may be easy to forgive, but other wrongs are not easy to forgive. Some wrongs may not be very egregious, but there are other wrongs that can leave painful scars for the remainder of our lives. I think of a young child that might be mistreated at the hands of an abusive adult. Many times that child carries those scars into their own adulthood, and they live with that pain and those scars for the remainder of their lives. It is not an easy thing to forgive uh, a situation like that. A nasty divorce can lead uh, to nasty scars, and it's not easy to get over something like that and just pass it off as though it is just something that's so easy to do. One man said, everybody thinks forgiveness is a great idea until we have to do it. It is hard to forgive, and it costs something to forgive. No one gets out of this world without having to be forgiven and no one gets out of this world without needing to extend forgiveness. So we're all in this thing together, right? Every one of us here today, there were times in our lives we needed forgiveness. We needed the forgiveness of God, certainly. And there are times we've needed the forgiveness of other people. And then there's also times that we must be gracious enough to extend forgiveness to other people, even people who don't want our forgiveness or who could care less about our forgiveness because we can't make it about them. When we talk about forgiveness, it is God's ability to release us from holding on to a hurt that will imprison us. So we give another person forgiveness and extend that forgiveness to them, not as much perhaps for them as it is for our own benefit. So this morning what we're going to do is we're going to look at the cries of Jesus from the cross, one of them in particular, when he says, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And we're going to unpack this idea of the forgiveness factor. Every year around this time of the year, we focus on these sayings of Jesus from the cross. I mentioned to you, he made seven declarations from the cross. For example, he looked over to the, to the penitent thief, and he said to that thief, after the thief had repented and said, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Remember what Jesus said to him? He said, today you will be with me in paradise one of the statements that Jesus made from the cross was to John, and he said, John, care for Mary, our mother. Another statement that Jesus made from the cross, he said to God the Father, why have you forsaken me? He also said in the dehydration of the crucifixion scene, he said, I am thirsty. He also said, it is finished. And he also said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. But the first time that the silence was broken from the cross was when Jesus uttered the words in verse number 34, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. When you study those last seven statements of Jesus, you will find that three of them are actually prayers. In one prayer, he asked the question, Father, why? Why have you forsaken me? In his final prayer, he surrenders to crucifixion and says, Father, into your hands I commend your spirit. But do you know the first time that he spoke from the cross, the first time was a prayer request. A prayer request. Father, 
forgive them. They know not what they do. Now, I find it very interesting that the only prayer request that he made from the cross was not for something for himself, but something for others. In the hour of his deepest need, he was not bent on revenge. He was not preoccupied with getting even. He was not interested in seeing his tormentors and his executioners suffer. But in this prayer request, he implores that God the Father would release those who actually bring about his crucifixion. So, let's look at this element of the crucifixion story this morning and see how that Jesus not only spoke about forgiveness and how he not only taught about it, but how he fleshed it out, how he lived it out. Oh, it's one thing to talk about it, isn't it? It's altogether different when we have to flesh it out. It's one thing to say, I believe it's a good concept, but it's another thing when we have to say to ourselves, I'm going to release this hurt. I'm going to let it go, and I'm going, <clears throat> pardon me, to extend forgiveness and grace. So, the first thing I want you to note this morning is as we look at the forgiveness of Jesus, his prayer reminds me of his selfless nature. When we think about his prayer from the cross, it is a reminder to me anyway of his selfless nature. Notice in verse number 34, and we'll just take it word by word. Notice he says, Father, forgive them. Unforgiveness is selfishness. Now let me say that again. You say, Pastor Darrell, that sounds hard, and I don't like that. Oh, but the Word of God cuts us, doesn't it? It is true. Unforgiveness is selfishness. Because unforgiveness says, I would rather hold on to this hurt. I would rather harbor these bad feelings and this bad emotion than I would to let it go. So I'm just going to selfishly hold on to the hurt that somebody's caused me. That way, every time I see them, I can remember it. And every time I hear their name called, I can remember that, that, that feeling that I had when they first hurt me. So I'm just going to hold on to it. I'm not about to release it. Unforgiveness is always selfishness. Think about the selfless nature of Jesus. Jesus gave up heaven to be born in a manger. Aren't you glad he wasn't selfish and said, I'm going to stay right here. But he gave up heaven and was born in a manger. He left the streets of gold to walk the dusty shores of Galilee. He left the praise of angels in glory, and he accepted the insults, the accusations, the, the, the humiliation, the ridicule of hate-filled people. Jesus was the most selfless person who ever lived. That's why we focus our attention around this time of year upon what he did upon the cross because as he dies there, he dies not as a selfish man, but he dies as a sinless, selfless person who absorbs all of the indignities hurled by a lost world and prays, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. The Bible says the day that Jesus was born, there was a great light in the sky. You remember that? But the day that Jesus died, there was darkness that covered the landscape. Angels sang the day Jesus was born. But at Calvary, when he died, all of heaven was silent. There was no room for Jesus when he was born. But I want you to know there was plenty of room for him when he died. Everybody left him. Everybody deserted him. And as he hangs there as the Lamb of God on the cross of Calvary, as though he is rejected both by heaven and earth, Jesus exemplifies this selfless nature as he absorbs in his body the ridicule that all of the world could hurl in his direction. At his birth, he was cuddled, wrapped in swaddling clothes, laid in a manger. But on Good Friday, he was crowned with thorns, he had nails driven into his hands. He had a spear thrust into his side. He had those who would stop by the cross and they would wag their heads and they would cluck their tongues and they would sit down and eat their lunch and watch him writhe in anguish and in pain. Incredible scene there is that he didn't have to do that. 
And he could have called legions of angels to mop up this mess in a hurry. But in his selfless nature, he chose to absorb all of that in his life. Do you know the Bible tells us that he was crucified uh, at the third hour, which is 9 o'clock in the morning. And he was on the cross of Calvary for six hours. So from 9 o'clock until 12 o'clock, it was daylight. And that's when he uttered these seven statements from the cross. The first one being, Father, into your hands, I com- uh, excuse me, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. We don't know if that happened right at 9 o'clock. We don't know if it happened uh, right at 12 o'clock, but we do know that he was on the cross for six hours. The first three hours were daylight. And then at noon, you remember some call it an eclipse? We just say that God let the sun refuse to shine and there was darkness that covered the entirety of the landscape because God was not going to let the world see Jesus breathe his last breath. So God just put his hand over the sun, the S-U-N. And there in the darkness of Calvary, Jesus would stay there on the cross for three more hours So from 9 o'clock to 12, it was daylight. From 12 to 3, it was dark. And at that first half of those six hours on the cross is when Jesus makes this statement, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. Now, in Jewish culture, it was a foreign concept to think about God in terms of being a personal father. Oh, they thought about God in terms of being the father of their nation. Uh, They thought about God being as in terms of being the father of the Jewish people. But never did the concept enter their mind that God would be a personal father to them. Do you remember when the disciples asked Jesus, they said, Lord, can you teach us how to pray? What did Jesus say to them? He said, pray after this manner, our father, which art in heaven. He wanted them to know that God is not simply a creator God who spoke the world into existence, but God wants to be your personal father. And Jesus exemplifies that here on the cross. When here in these first three hours of crucifixion, he prays to his father. You see, all throughout his life and throughout his earthly ministry, he spoke with words of authority. In fact, the Bible says his words made the hearts of men burn. His words were penetrating. His words were truth. And some of the most profound words that he would ever utter was right here in the heat of the noonday sun, nailed to a cross, dying for the sins of the world. He did not curse his enemies. He did not spew bitterness. He did not spew hatred. He didn't try to get people to sympathize with him. He didn't try try to get people on his side to set the record straight. He was so far above all of that that he lifts his eyes toward the Father. And moments before he took his last breath, he can be heard praying for his enemies. So he refused to hold people in an emotional prison, but he released them. And he died not a bitter man, Not a hate-filled man, but he died as a man with a heart of forgiveness. So right here in this Lenten season, again, next Sunday is Palm Sunday. The following Sunday is Easter Sunday. The question I have for you is not have you been hurt by something, a situation. Maybe your job didn't work out the way you thought it was going to be, and your your boss uh, left you disillusioned. Maybe your marriage didn't work out the way you thought it was going to be, and now every relationship that you think about brings back the pain of the first one that didn't work out. Or maybe in your family there's a situation of of hurt feelings there that's yet to be resolved. So the question I have for you today is not, have you been injured or have you been hurt or have you been heartbroken or have you been offended? We're all in that same boat. My question to you today is, what are you doing with that? And perhaps more importantly is, What are you allowing that to do to you? Or even more important than that, what are you allowing that to do through you? We all have hurt, right? We all who need to be forgiven. We all need to extend forgiveness. Some people live in anger for the remainder of their lives, and they become best friends with bitterness. Some live in depression, and they're married to self-pity. Some live in denial, 
and they live with unresolved conflict. You know, a good synonym for, uh, for forgiveness is pardon. Another synonym would be mercy. So when we're talking about forgiveness, we're talking about pardon. We're talking about mercy. A good antonym for forgiveness is punishment. <laughs> punishment. Holding on to something so somebody can be punished. Or, here's another antonym, blame. Blame. Why is fallen human nature given to blame? Adam and Eve played the blame game in the Garden of Eden. God, uh, Adam said to God, God, it's not my fault. It's the woman you gave me. She's responsible. Eve said, Lord, it's not my fault. It's the devil's fault. Uh, he's the one that deceived me, and he's the one that tempted me. And mankind continually plays that blame game. The Hebrews blamed God for leading them out into the wilderness. You remember that scene? After God had fed them with manna and gave them rock, uh, water from the rock, they said, we're so sick of this manna. God, we want to go back to Egypt and have the leeks and the garlic and the onions and all the good things that we had while we were there in Egypt. My goodness, how quickly they had forgotten, right? So they began to blame God for their situation. Job, Job never blamed God necessarily for his situation, but Job's wife said, Job, just curse God and die and get it over with. You remember Martha in the New Testament? She blamed Jesus and she said, Jesus, if you would have gotten here earlier, my brother would not have died. Oh, it's easy. It's easy to play the blame game. One man said, when you blame others, you give up your power to change. Now, as you look at this verse, and again, we're just looking at it topically this morning, and you see those words where Jesus prays, Father, forgive them. Here's what many Bible scholars say about this verse. Verse. We could go into, uh, into the diagrammatical analysis of it and look at the verb tense, but the long and the short, here's what many Bible scholars say about this, this verse. That Jesus didn't just pray it one time, and it has to do with the construction of the, uh, of the verse itself. I'll spare you all those details. But that Jesus didn't just pray this prayer one time. But sc Bible scholars tell us that he prayed it multiple times. Multiple times. Perhaps even beginning with his trial. Perhaps even as he stood before Caiaphas, the high priest. Perhaps as he stood before Pilate, and Pilate would wash his hands in the basin of water and say, I find no fault in this man. Perhaps as he put that patabulum across his shoulder, and he walked down the Via Della Rosa headed for Calvary, maybe he was saying that prayer then, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. Or the onlookers, those of you who went with us to Israel, you remember how we walked the Via Della Rosa. And all of those, those streets were so narrow, lined with shops all along the way, and it was so crowded as we kind of wormed our way through the crowd. Imagine the scene on Good Friday when Jesus was making his way down that Via Della Rosa, that way of suffering, and hearing people jeer and ridicule and mock him and maybe many steps along the way, he would pray that prayer, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. I remember uh, the first time Tina had mentioned uh, the Passion of the Christ, and we talked about it the other, other day, you know, to watch it again, it's just hard to watch it. But we've seen it two or three times over the years. But I remember the first time I saw it, uh, Mel Gibson portrayed uh, Jesus as saying this prayer, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. He has, he has it portrayed this way. Just as the executioners lay Jesus on the cross and extend his arms outward and the nails begin to pierce his flesh, he looks directly to the camera and says, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Pretty powerful. Pretty powerful moment. Because I find myself in that scene, and I have to be honest and say, I just don't think I could do that. I don't think I could do that because I don't have that selfless nature. I want to have, 
but I don't have that selfless nature that Christ had. It is a constant reminder of his selflessness when he endured everything that the devil could throw at him, and he said, Father, just forgive him. Let him off the hook. Man, we wouldn't pray that prayer. That'd be hard to pray. You mean let him off the hook? You mean let him get away with it? You mean let him get by with it? You mean just kind of erase the debt and forgive them? That's why I say that Jesus' prayer reminds me of his selfless nature. But second, his prayer reminds me to be a forgiving person. Listen, how could I, uh, how could we, I'll use the editorial we, how could we, who have been forgiven of so much, ever withhold forgiveness? How could we who have been forgiven of so much? So when I think about these words of Jesus from the cross, Father, forgive them. It reminds me to be a forgiving person. The apostle Peter came to Jesus one day and he said, Lord, how many times should I forgive somebody? Uh, Till seven times? And Jesus said, not seven times, Peter, but 70 times seven. That's 490 times. You say, Pastor Darrell, do I just keep a record? And when I get to 490 times, I say, okay, that's it. No, it is the, uh, the language of exaggeration. Jesus is saying, just be a person who doesn't keep score. Just be a person who, who doesn't keep a record. Now listen, that doesn't, mean, that doesn't mean that you have to put yourself in a position where a person continually mistreats you and a person continues to take advantage of you. If that happens, you, know, you can just simply say, I love this person, but I can't, I can't uh, continue to open myself up to the hurt that they're bringing into my life. But what we don't want to do is harbor hatred in our lives. We would not be modeling the example Jesus left. We don't want to be harboring bitterness in our life because that's not the model that Jesus gave us. In fact, oftentimes, those who have offended us are those who may be out to get us, are those who just simply uh, want to see our demise. For whatever reason, they think they're in the right. Listen, do you know, do you know it was actually, in the scripture, when you look at it, it was actually the religious people that caused Jesus the greatest problem. It was actually those Pharisees who were, who were probably at the upper crust of the religious people that caused him the greatest problems and caused him the greatest struggles. And sometimes you don't expect hurt to come from maybe a fellow believer, but I'm telling you, the devil can use anybody, can he? And he will use anybody. And sometimes when that happens, that individual may not even know that they're being used by the devil. Listen, always remember, always remember, you cannot control other people. You can't control, nor can I, what other people might say. You can't control what other people might think. You can't control gossip that other people might spread. You can't control the actions of other people. We can't be the Holy Spirit in other people's lives. We can't change their heart. We can't change their attitude. We can't change their thinking. The only thing that we can do is try to live above the circumstances of life and exemplify Jesus Christ in the way that we live. That's what he did. Jesus taught about it. Jesus spoke about it. But what speaks to us perhaps greater than anything is how he fleshed it out. Right here on the cross, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. Remember, Jesus told the story of a king who decided to call in his debts. And he sent his collection agents to return uh, with people who owed him money. And they brought him one individual who was so far in debt that this man could never have gotten out of debt. In fact, uh, it is said that he owes somewhere in today's standard would be roughly about $25 million to this king. And the king has his collection agents to bring this man before him and demand payment. And the man is like, I don't have it. And there's no way I can come up with it. I'm bankrupt, I'm broke, and there's no way that I can ever satisfy this debt. And the man just kind of begs for mercy. And as Jesus tells this story, he says that this king was filled with compassion. So moved by this man's um, sorrow and, 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 and his bankrupt spirit that this king actually forgave the debt and said, okay, 
you don't owe me anything. He wiped the slate clean and said, you're free to go. All right, now here's this guy who's just been forgiven of a $25 million debt. He's walking down the road. Now, this is the story that Jesus tells. He's walking down the road, and he comes face to face with another man. And this man happens to owe him some money. Not $25 million. We're going to say about $5. A meager amount. A small amount. And the guy who had been forgiven of so much says to this man who owes him $5, you owe me five bucks, I'll take my money now. And the man says, I don't have it, I can't pay you. And this man who had been forgiven of so much, the Bible says he takes him by the throat and he chokes him and he says, you pay me now what you owe me and has this man cast into prison. How in the world could a person that has been forgiven of so much hold on to such a meager element of unforgiveness, but it is, it is an expression of our own sinfulness. Jesus would say to us, we who have been forgiven of so much, you and I, how could we ever hold on to anything that, is, that, is, uh, that has been an offense or a hurt or a misunderstanding? How could we nurse that like a woman would a child? How could we hold on to that and harbor that in our lives when, when, when we have highly offended God? Listen, I don't want to minimize any kind of offense or hurt that anybody in this congregation has ever had in your life. But there's not one of us that has been hurt more than we have hurt Christ. There's not been one of us that has been offended more than what we have offended Christ. And he forgave us. He sent his son to die for us, and he took, took all of our sin and laid it on the shoulders of his son so you and I, who would rather than go to debtor's prison, can be set free. So Jesus says, prayer, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they do. Not only reminds me of his selfish nature, but it reminds me, Daryl, you better be a forgiving person. Let that remind you of the same thing during this Lenten season. Let me give you the third one very quickly. His prayer reminds me of his selfless nature and reminds me to be a forgiving person, his prayer also reminds me of my own need to be forgiven. Everybody needs it. Notice what he says there. He says, they know not what they do. You say, Daryl, it's not those that hurt me because they are ignorant of it that bothers me. It's those who know exactly what they're doing and they have it out for me. That's not what Jesus is saying. Here's what he's saying. It's probably best illustrated by the life of Joseph, who's one of my favorite Old Testament characters. Joseph was um, a man who probably had as much right as anybody to be, to be bitter. Joseph was betrayed by his brothers. They took his coat of many colors that his father had gave him, given him, and they stripped it from his back, soaked it in animal blood, sent it back to his dad, and said, wild animals has killed Joseph. And in reality, what they did, they threw Joseph in a pit, and they sat down and they, uh, at the mouth of this pit, and they contemplated on what they're going to do with him. And the brothers decided they were going to kill him. The oldest brother, Reuben, says, no, let's make a little money off of him. So they sell him into a, uh, to the hands of a band of uh, Ishmaelite travelers. Joseph finds himself in Egypt. He was just a teenager when this happened. Finds himself in Egypt living away from his family. You know the story of Joseph. Uh, he goes from, from being a slave to, to, uh, to, to rising up eventually from a series of events that happened in his life to being the second in command in all of Egypt in charge of the distribution of grain. And when his brothers come years and years and years later to buy grain because of a famine, who do they stand before but Joseph? Here's Joseph's words to his brothers. You low-down scoundrels. I'm going to give you what you deserve. No, that's not what he said. Joseph said, what you meant for evil, God meant it for good. Meaning you might have had bad intention when you sold, threw me in the well, when you sold me to, as a slave. You had bad intentions when you told dad that I was dead. But all along, God was working behind the scenes to bring me to this place where ultimately I could help save your sorry behinds. So what you meant for evil, 
God meant it for good. So sometimes when those offenses come into our lives, when those hurts come into our lives, it's not the circumstance that we got to focus on, but we got to see the big picture. What is God doing through all of this? What is God working out through all of this? And more than anything else, it's a reminder that I need God's forgiveness, that you need God's forgiveness. If anybody had a good reason not to forgive, it would have been Jesus. Think about it. Isn't Jesus really, when you think about it, isn't he the only true victim that ever existed? He was totally innocent. Totally innocent of any wrongdoing. Never had a bad thought, never had a bad day, (laughs) never said a bad word, never had a bad intention. And in the end, they all attacked him. In fact, they say, free Barabbas, who was a murderer, and crucify Jesus. And let his blood be upon us and upon our children. The Bible says he was like a lamb led to the slaughter. And when he had the opportunity on the cross to call the legions of angels and to mop up this sorry world, his prayer was directed to his father, and he said, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. It is a reminder that we all need forgiveness. I'm as guilty of the crucifixion of Jesus as the soldier who drove the nails. You are as guilty of the crucifixion of Jesus as the soldiers who drove the nails. We're all guilty. He could have easily have said, Father, forgive Daryl. He doesn't know what he's doing. He could have easily said, Father, forgive, place your name right there. You don't know what you're doing. Take that prayer of Jesus and personalize it for yourself. Father, forgive, Daryl. Forgive, put your name there. And I believe you'd come away with the song that we sang this morning by Isaac Watts, when I survey the wondrous cross on which the Prince of Glory died, my richest gains I count but loss, and I pour contempt on all my pride. It is pride that says I'm not going to forgive. It is pride that says I'm not going to release the other. It is pride that says I'm going to hold on to this. It is pride that says I'm going to build a wall around me and I'm never going to be hurt again. All of that is pride. And the Bible says pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. Everyone needs forgiveness and everyone needs to extend forgiveness. So as we look at that model of Jesus, that model that says, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. You know I love history, particularly the era around World War II and uh, what happened to the Jewish people during that time. And often I share with you uh, a little illustration here and there of something that came out of that era. There's a story told about the Ravensbrück concentration camp back in 1939 where Corey Ten Boone uh, would spend uh, a good portion of her, of her years uh, during the war. Her sister Betsy actually died in that concentration camp. It was a concentration camp primarily for women and held over 90,000 women at its, at its highest point. They found this slip of paper sewn inside the kind of the pajamas or the clothing of a little child that had perished, and this is what it said. Apparently the mother had written it and sewn it inside the clothing O Lord, remember not only the men and women of goodwill, but also those of ill will. But do not remember all the suffering they have inflicted upon us. Instead, remember the fruits we have borne because of this suffering. Our fellowship, our loyalty to one another, our humility, our courage, our generosity, the greatness of heart that has grown from this trouble. When our persecutors come to be judged by you, let all of these fruits that we have borne be their forgiveness. Wow. Wow. Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. Here's my challenge to you for the Lent season as we close. You think about those things that we've been holding on to for a long time. I'm going to challenge you. Let it go. Amen, church? Let it go. Let it go. Because I believe 
the greatest prison that a person can, can ever find themselves in is the prison of an unforgiving heart and soul. Let it go. Let it go and let God have the victory. Shall we pray together? Father God, thank you for your word. And as we've just simply looked at this one little passage, my goodness, what, what truth and what depth of truth there is. And it is difficult, Lord. I will acknowledge difficult, painfully difficult, to take it off the page and put it in our lives. But that's what you ask us to do. As we have this time of invitation, Lord, you can speak to the hearts like no one else. And God, if there's one here today that has that, that spirit of unforgiveness, God, I pray that you'd help them just to release it and to let it go. Lord, I pray that during this season leading up to Easter, that we would all be challenged to live more like Jesus. Maybe there are folk here today, God, who want to unite with our church family, who just want to come and pray, or what it, whatever it might be. I just ask, God, that there'd be a spirit of liberty in this place. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.